Hi there, welcome to Restore. It's a course that has been set up by the chaplains at Juvenile Justice and it's a course that's meant to help us discover more about life, faith, how we go about doing things, what attitudes do we have. We all need to challenge ourselves, we all need comfort. So Restore is about real evidence, secret treasure, offered relationship, and this course we hope will be for absolutely everybody. No matter where you're coming from, no matter what your experiences have been, no matter what you believe right now, we want you to know that you're welcome to the Restore course. Because much of this course is going to be hearing things, yes, but the other side is you can ask questions. There'll be lots of conversation. So we're really hoping that you enjoy this course and feel part of it. Welcome to Restore. And now this is part one. You'll remember that Restore is about real evidence, secret treasure, offered relationship, and that this course is for everybody. So we start now with real evidence. Do you know in the world in which we're in today, evidence is needed for almost everything. If you go to an ATM to take out some money, the bank requires evidence. You have to have your card and you have to have your PIN number. If you go to enrol in a college course, they want evidence of maybe some exam results you've already done, your birth certificate and so on. Driving, again, we need to have evidence that we're a qualified driver. So many parts of life are calling for evidence. We know that uh, in many of our situations, we are in the justice system also because of evidence. People gathered evidence. It was maybe a, a camera in a shop or a camera out on a road picking up evidence. Cameras are everywhere. It's interesting that the world is now looking very closely at our movements. We have a Lord God who knows all about us, who looks closely at all of our movements. He really cares about us and many people out there really care about us. So it really is all about our identity, our ID, people needing to know who we are. Okay, we can't even travel without ID. You need your passport and some of the uh, systems that we go through at airports and other ports these days involve multiple ways of verifying that we are who we say we are. Even our dog from very early on has to have a, a little chip to verify its identity. So if Jess goes out for a walk on her own and gets lost, manages to get out that wee hole in the hedge or whatever, if she gets picked up by someone, that wee chip can be scanned and immediately they can discover who the dog is and who the dog belongs to. So who we are and what we get up to is a big deal in today's world, and rightly so, especially when it keeps us all safer. So I think to be fair to you, Restore is all about um, helping us to uh, find evidence. I mean, it's, it's all very well for chaplains to come in and to start praying with us and sharing faith and to read from the Bible and so on. But I reckon you are probably thinking, where's the evidence? And I think really, to be honest with you, the evidence is all around us. And the beauty of creation, the evidence is also in the Bible. The evidence is um, everywhere. So let's just think carefully in this Restore course about evidence. I'd like you to take a moment now and just discuss in your small group how important identity is. Uh, of course the positives are being safe and keeping safe, but I'd like you also maybe to discuss for a minute, are there any downsides to uh, everybody being identified? So just discuss identity 
and the fact that we're known. As one of your chaplains who shares the message of God's existence and the sending of his son Jesus to heal and to help us in life, I recognise that this too is a massive claim. Is there any evidence for Jesus? Where is that evidence? Real evidence for the existence of God and the identity of Jesus? Why on earth would we pray to this God or call out to him for help and healing in our lives? Is this Jesus true? Can he really strengthen me and bring me hope? These are valid life questions which everybody should ask. So walk with me and our guests through this DVD Restore course and we will face these questions together. Take the DVD at your own pace, in your own room if you want to, or if you prefer, ask one of the chaplains to arrange a group viewing with you and some of your friends and work through the discussion points together. So we come to real evidence, RE in the word restore, real evidence around us. So for real evidence I've taken three areas. The first area that we're going to look at is creation. The second area are words written by people called prophets, hundreds of years before Jesus came to earth. Prophecies that foretold in detail about his family tree, where he would be born, and even how he would be killed. Things which he had no control over as a baby, or as someone helplessly nailed to a cross. Old Testament prophecies, which we know for sure were not added to by Jesus' followers after he lived and died to make them fit. The discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls in 1947 has put an end to that. Then thirdly, there is the evidence of what we could call turnaround life testimonies. The life stories of people who radically changed their beliefs and their behaviours, some of whom even punished or killed because they dared to believe in the claims and love of Jesus Christ. So what about the world that we live in? When we stop and think about creation, when we take seriously the beauty that's around us or the great expanse of the universe, what comes to mind? Could there be a creator? Is it all the result of um, some atoms banging together and the Big Bang Theory? What do you think yourself? As somebody who believes in a creator God, I often look at the world, and indeed King David did as well, he often thought about the moon and the stars that God had set in space or the beautiful fields or the mountains and valleys. And he gave God thanks for everything. But was that just ancient superstition? I mean, after all, people did bow down and worship the sun and the moon and the stars. But for those who believe that God is a creator, there's a lot to think about. An ancient religious thinker and philosopher called Thomas Aquinas was convinced that God exists and said that where there is a watch, there is a watchmaker. He meant by this that logically, in the same way as the precision mechanics of a watch show us that there was someone who made that watch. So in the same way, when we look at the world of its rhythms and seasons, day to night and night to day, and the miracle of life, so these natural things are proof that there is a divine maker. In other words, today's amazing scientific discoveries and developments show us basically how immense God's wisdom and power is. 
We are simply as aspiring and adventurous human beings discovering what God has done. The discovery of medicines and treatments, progress in telecommunications, information technology, space travel and everything like that. The good sense behind the rules of life that God has designed in the Ten Commandments. These are all from God. These are for our good and for our protection. But do we believe that God is the creator? Do we accept that there is a divine hand? And certainly the book of Genesis gives us that steer right from the very beginning of the Bible. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So is the Bible correct to say that there is a divine designer? Or were these ancient men like Moses simply writing down from their ancient setting how they viewed the physical world around them and what the purpose of human existence is, 70 years and lights out, or an eternal life, a hereafter? I'd like you to spend just a wee bit of time now discussing what you think about the creation of the world. Do you believe the world has been created by God, by a divine designer, or do you think otherwise? Share those views now in your discussion group. Okay, so we're thinking about the existence of God and do we believe in the existence of God? We're thinking about evidence, real evidence. And that first uh, little part that you were discussing there was about creation. Do you believe that God created the world? Are you with Thomas Aquinas and many, many other people who say, well, you know, things work seasonally and by day and by night and all sorts of rhymes and rhythms in life. So there is a creator behind that. Or is it a, a more scientific view that you take? Or is theology necessarily unscientific to believe that God is the creator? Um, it's there and you're thinking about that. But the second area of evidence for God, this whole area of the prophets, people who spoke about the life of Jesus hundreds and hundreds of years before he came, uh, where would he be born? How would he be born? what would he be like, um, how he would die, even right down to the clothes being divided at the foot of the cross. These things were all foretold in the Old Testament by prophets like Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Micah. And whenever we come to think about that very seriously, we begin to think about a God who has given us this type of information because he is a communicator. He does want us to know. And sometimes when I think about the ministry of Jesus and his teaching, things like uh, those who have ears to hear, let them hear. You know, those who have eyes to see, let them look. Uh, I'm kind of wondering, is it that Jesus is saying the evidence is in the Bible as well, that you can actually read these prophecies and understand that God is a communicator and that he tells us well in advance. He even tells us the end from the beginning, the Bible says, so that we may know and be convinced that this God is true and that he's a communicator. I'm thinking that uh, probably the carol service is one of the most obvious uh, places where you find Bible prophecies. You know, the first half of the carol service is all about the Old Testament looking forward to the coming of Jesus. And then the second half of the carol service and the readings from the Bible are from the Gospels. And uh, Matthew's Gospel often talks about as, as it is written, as it is written. And he was a, a Jewish Gospel writer writing to Jewish people. And he was trying to convince them way back in the first century that, you know, this Jesus is true as it is written in the Old Testament. By the way, there is a, a very good book that you might like to get out of the, uh, the library. Uh, it's entitled Evidence That Demands a Verdict by a writer called Josh McDowell. And uh, it's quite a thick book, but nonetheless, um, you can sort of dip into it and have a look at some of the areas that are particularly 
um, interesting. And he talks a lot about um, the life of Christ being foretold in the Old Testament, being fulfilled in his, in his life. So uh, if you can get your hands on that book or ask the chaplain and the chaplain will bring the book in. That's just one of many. There are quite a few books out there that are very, very helpful on this subject. Okay, we're thinking about uh, real evidence and we said that there were three areas. We were um, looking at the evidence of creation and then we were thinking about the Old Testament prophets and you've had time to discuss things. Now we're coming to a third area and I'd like to call those the turnaround testimonies. And this is really about people whose life stories um, are very impressive and they've given so much in their lives for the, the cause of, if you like, the kingdom of God. We think back to the uh, New Testament, um, the people like uh, St. Paul who went through so many hardships in his life shipwrecks and being imprisoned in Philippi and in Rome and many, many other experiences. Times when he hardly had enough to eat and other times when he said he had plenty. And of course then he has this wonderful verse, for me to live is Christ, to die is gain. And that's very impacting, not only St. Paul, but also in the uh, Gospels you have people like John, you know, who was exiled to the island of Patmos. He gave to us the... Uh, the Gospel of John, the three letters of John and the book of Revelation. And this guy, John, had gone through an awful lot as well. He's believed to have been the disciple whom Jesus loved and the one who Jesus really enjoyed talking to and sharing with. And that, that's important that we understand that these people went through lots for the name of Jesus. Many of them died and many Christians in the early church and since the early church have given their lives for the cause of the gospel. So I want to talk to some people now who will be telling us their turnaround life stories. And we'll be talking to uh, Bobby Matheson now and hearing what he has to say. Bobby, good to see you. Bobby Matheson, Esquire. Yeah. Good to have you here. Bobby, you've been involved in juvenile justice for a wee while uh, on the team. Yeah. That's really good to have you. But one of the reasons why it's really good to have you is because of your own life story and that for you, obviously, some of those experiences that you were having began as a, as a young person. Yeah. Do you want to take us through your, your life story a bit and then we'll see where we go to from there? Yeah. Um, well, yeah, I grew up in Highfield, really, in the, in the, the top of the shackle, really, and I lived there from the age of, of one to ten, um, and then then that the end years, I believe, right, was a lot of the years that so I made be the person young, do you know what I mean, or turned me into the person I was. Um, but um, so things I remember um, about growing up there and how I feel was I went to Sunday school and, and um, we used to sing songs like Jesus loved me, yes I know, because the Bible tells me so, and running over, running over my cups full of since the Lord saved me, I was happy. I learned about Noah and Moses and Joseph and King David and learned all many things as a child. Um, and one of the songs I remember I'm singing was Down in the Dumps, You Shall Not Go, That's Where the Devil Keeps You Low. I'll sing with all my might as I shame my armour about Down in the Dumps, You Shall Not Go. And the place behind or the church then, it was the Ballinger Martin Road Baptist, right. um, was Woodville Park, but they called it the Dumps, mm -hmm. and right. the jungle. Right. And I lived. In there, right? It was like in there every day, yes. Um, and it was like just charging through big overgrown stuff, and all that. We all lived down there. And when they were singing down in the dumps, you shall not go. That's for the day. I thought they were talking about them dumps, oh, right? You know? <laughs> um, and and so, as, as people in the church were trying to teach me right and, and teach me the, the God's ways, um, mm. the world or down in the dumps was leading me a different road. And um, from very young and, and, and growing up. Um, you were a footballer. Yeah. You were yeah. a good footballer. Yeah. And you were playing good level football for good teams. Yeah. What happened? Because you were meant to go to England, really, weren't you? Well, the, you were getting, you were becoming that good. Yeah. Well, the football side, our family were all footballers. We were all my brother played from United for a few years, and and he came back and played for playing most of his days. 
Um, our family played for Glentoran for a hundred years. My own kids are footballers, um, but I was playing for um, at, at a young age. I was playing um, for school um, and, and and playing against teams and scoring loads of goals and was a, a forward and, and and people thought I was going here, going there, but I ended up signing for Linfield, which is one of the worst things you can do in my family because we're all Glentoran supporters. <laughs> Um, and so, say for Glentoran when I was about 16, or sorry for Olympia when I was 16, um, and started um, just playing for them. And, um, and I had a trial across the water that stage with Sheffield United. And I remember when I was over there, they said to me, Would you like to come over here? And I went, No, no, because I didn't really think, know what I was doing. I was only a kid, and I wasn't really thick and skin. But no, I played for Linfield um, for a couple of years, um, just the Swifts. Yeah. Side. Right, and okay. Um so life was actually pretty good. What then happened that things flipped a bit for you in your life experience? Well, um... Because you went to prison. Yeah. I got a bit unsettled at Linfield. Um, the troubles in Northern Ireland were, were fired up. I got brought up in the troubles and, and so as I was saying earlier on there, my youth sort of built me into some of the, the things that I learned as a youth about fighting against people and all sorts of stuff that was being done. So the way at that age still was there and the troubles were still on and in and, and our communities we were told that the IRA were destroying our countries and, and when you see what was happening that could be a, a truth that we we seen. Um, and so as I was playing football all the all normal things of life, the dark dances and parties and discos were all there and so was the troubles. Mm. Um, and then me, at the age of about 17, I got on settled in Linfield and wanted to sign for Glen Thorne. Mm. Um, the team, Linfield wouldn't release me, and so I ended up um, signing for a, a team in East Belfast while I was waiting. Um, and the team in East Belfast ended up um, a pub team. And because of my mum, that's the only reason why I joined it. Um, but the people in that, that team were all Parmelers. Okay. So you were making new friends. Yeah. And then things happened, and you went to prison, but you went to prison for quite a while. Yeah, yeah. Well, I had happened about 18, I got involved in the troubles, the hunger strikes were on then. Um, I ended up getting involved in um, every every crime you could think of, every every <coughs> sin, even mm-hmm. one that, that was out there I was involved in. Um, and what happened in 1982, seven of us um, got arrested and put in the, the criminal road jail, charged with um, every kind of charge, including murders. Okay. Um, and so we stayed two and a half years in remand in the criminal jail um, and then in 1985 all, all of us got sentenced to life. Um, mm-hmm. so 18 years? Sentence, yeah, no I was 20 years of age when I got sentenced, okay. um, or sorry when I went into prison mm-hmm. um, and then we got sentenced in 85 and the sadness was, was most of them would have been in 20s. Um, when you were in prison did you did you meet chaplains, did you, did you, I mean, yeah. were, you said you went to Sunday school so yeah. Were services something that you would have gone to, or did you kind of leave that behind no. you, or, or what, what was no, going on that way? The, the, the Sunday, Sunday services, first of all, in the criminal jail were places where you met. Everybody. That would have been Jackson Buick, would it? Jackson yeah. Buick would have been on the wings. He used to come into my cell and beat, beat me up. And oh, did he? Oh, I used to come in and say, See you, you wee raker, and he used to fight with me. And great wee preacher. Great wee mom. Yeah. And he always had a time for me, you know, and then mm-hmm. there was the, the Free Presbyterian Church was on there too, mm-hmm, in mm-hmm. the criminal jail, and you know, went there, and every Christmas you got a box of chocolates. Uh-huh, Mr. Uh-huh. Beasley used to bring boxes of chocolates, okay. so it was a draw. Um, <laughs> but as we went to churches, the, we were meeting each other from different wings and all, that was, the, that was why we went, but we respected the word, and you would listen, you wouldn't talk, you would have respect for that. And so sometimes, I believe the word was breaking people down, and I remember one incident, Reverend McElveen, Talking uh-huh. about having a relationship with this amazing God and how Jesus died for him and he based his life on it. Uh-huh. Um, and what he says was, if at the end of all this there is no God, he says, I've lost nothing because I've got a good life and a peaceful life and joy because I've believed all what I believe. Mm-hmm. He says, but if you, if at the end of this, if there is a God and you haven't got him, you've lost everything. And so the way he was another one that sort of hit, hit home at me, you know. Yeah. And then when we moved to the maze, um, there was a free Presbyterian church. So you moved direct from Crumlin Road Prison to... We all, we all got sentenced to life in 1985 and the sevens went down to the Mays Prison. And right. went on to the oh, Lawless yeah. Wings of right. the Mays. Um, and the Lawless Wings of the Mays is icky and there was church. Um, yes. And one of the churches in, in, in there was the free Presbyterian church. And if you, if, you made your, if you became free Presbyterian, they kept you on the same wing uh-huh. because the church was on that wing. Uh-huh. And so all the footballers became free press. Uh-huh, uh-huh. just to get on that wing to play football together right. um, and we thought we were being cute um, but 
I believe God was being cute because uh-huh. we had to go to church as yes. part of that deal. Yes. So we heard the word of God. I remember um, Reverend McCray Craig talking about um, every time you hear this message about Jesus dying on a cross and being beaten up and spat on and mocked, um, and then being nailed to a cross and dying for you, and you reject it, you may as well do it. Mm-hmm. Um, and when many people get saved in the church mm-hmm. and in prison, and mm-hmm. people think, oh, they get saved in prison, um, and it's not genuine, but I'm telling you now, some of them, some of them boys that get saved in prison are pastors now, and yeah. haven't, they've changed and they've been on. I myself didn't get saved. Some people thought it was just to get, just to get out. remission, but yeah. that really didn't happen. It doesn't, you know. doesn't affect anything. No, no, doesn't affect no. Anything. you still serve your, your sentence. No. Um, so well, then, what about yourself? What? How did it all come together for you then, spiritually? Uh, in prison, in, in prison, um, I believe because I was sitting under the word of God, but because people had planted seeds in my heart from a no age, that, that the word of God sort of affected me, and it affected me. And this, my conscience started playing upon the things I'd done all my life, not just the power of least from no age. Mm. Um, and so I started looking at myself, and I didn't like what I seen. Mm-hmm. Um, and it actually hated me probably more than anybody could hate me. When we get sentenced to life in prison, we had no remorse um, for what we'd done because we thought we'd justify ourselves because of the, the troubles, um, which was a load of rubbish, but that's what we thought. Um, but this started to, to look, I started looking within myself and didn't like what I'd seen, um, and my head started going, and it actually hated me, and I thought, then I started thinking that people could see my sin, and I thought, and this might sound mad, but it's the truth, and I thought people, um, see the stuff I had done and they hated me and I thought there was this plan, all, all chaos um, in the mind. Um, what happened was I believed that this God, that I'd heard the word of God all these times and I'd rejected it all them times and I'd lost my chance. And so what I'd done is I was so bad that I couldn't even accept God as a saviour. And so this, when all this mix up I thought it was just a piece of dirt. And so what I'd done was I tried to treat me the, the way I thought I should have been treated and I tried to kill me. Um, and you tried to kill yourself? Yes. Okay. Try to take me in the prison? Yep. Right. In the prison. Um, because I didn't like what I seen. Okay. And I thought God didn't want somebody like me. Okay. Um, so they put God me. just couldn't sort you out. No. He could sort everybody else out, but, but not you me. were beyond no. it. I just okay. thought, I thought I'd, like many people like me, I'd overstepped the lane mm. um, and there was no coming back. And I'd heard the word of God and what my man was telling me that you'd heard and you'd rejected and that's you. Right. Um, and that's what I believed. And Try to take me on life, they put me in the psychiatric ward in McGabry Prison. They moved me up to McGabry Prison and put me in there, and I kept me in there for two years. Um, just didn't want to be alive, they just and eventually they medicated me, um, and I was like a zombie. Um, and I just believed that. Um, so, the first in the Bible called John 10 10, it says, There's a thief comes to steal and to kill and mm. destroy, but I've come to give you life and give you money. And I believe that I was left destroyed, I was left a sh- an empty shell. I had nothing inside me that thought any worth it be. Um, I thought I was just the worst person in the world. And, and a lot of stuff I've done lends you to think that. Um, and I just thought there's no way for me to come back. And thank God for, for doctors and medication because they medicated me and, and got me back and the, able to cope, but just barely. Um, and so, full full of medication, I went back on the wings and sat with Christians in the wings and then I got out of prison. I went into prison when I was um, 20. And I got out when I was 34. Okay. And where do we go from there then? When I got out of prison, um, I just... Not immediately better, I wouldn't have thought. No, I mean, you... No, I was a mess. I was an absolute mess. But the people that I thought hated me and, and the paramilitaries that thought it was going to do me in and stuff, they had a party for me in East Belfast coming out. Okay. And I stayed in the party like a zombie because I was fully medicated. Um, and I always say... I met my wife in that state, had long ginger hair with this ginger moustache. You had ginger hair? Yeah, and I was like that. And, and I met my wife, and how she ever went out, I don't know. But I met my wife, and um, somebody said to me one time, um, Is your wife blind? Be- beauty <laughs> is in the eye of the beholder. It probably. must be. Uh-huh. It must be. But I met my wife, um, and ended up with five children. Okay. Um, got married and had, ended up with five children. And life took over me again. Do you know what I mean? That, that I had mm-hmm. to go, I had to work. I, had, mm-hmm. I always worked, and as soon as I got out of the, from jail, I worked again. And mm-hmm. I always worked, and, and I had to work, and I had to remember kids, and I had to start doing that. And, mm-hmm. and so I ended up getting out of prison, leaving the apartment that was behind me, because I was scared of that word all the gear. Um, met my wife, had my family, ended up with a, a big, massive house, and all the cars, and my own business, and doing really, really well, and it all appeared. What were you doing? I was a joiner before I went into prison, mm-hmm. and I was back doing joinery work, and fitting floors. Um, and I ended up having my own shop mm-hmm. that I sold the floors and I fitted them as well. Um, mm-hmm. And so 
say in, in the eyes of the world it looked all okay because it had, it, it had wife, children, beautiful kids, beautiful wife, beautiful house, all then two and three times a year, big business, and it all looked well and good. Saying it says in the Bible, what's it a profit a man if he gain the whole world mm-hmm. and lose his soul? Yeah. And then say my mind, I thought I was lost. I thought there was no way back. I knew there was a God. And I just knew Jesus died on the cross, and I knew one day I'm going to have to deal with and I thought I, 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 was, I was lost. And I still lived a front, and many people I know do the same today, I lived with a front that everything's okay, but in here it's not. But that's interesting what you say about you know people living a pretense, putting up a good front, yeah. having a mask on, yeah. uh, but underneath they're churning and they feel so empty. Yeah. And yet, materially, you. You were flying, flying yeah. you know. So, where did it go to from that phase then to your faith? Well, what happened was, um, I say we we're doing really well for ourselves, and but my main, my main was still in the same place it was in prison that I'd lost my soul and I couldn't be saved. And it was this dirt and this filth on. I didn't look. I didn't like what I'd I, I done. I, I always say it's like this big ball of sin. Mm. And every, every time we could have heavier and heavier. And I was carrying it like a big ball of sin. Um, and I couldn't get it anywhere. And I couldn't put it anywhere. And I couldn't even speak some of the things out of my mouth what I'd done. Um, I was at a place the other and I fell up prayed out in a prayer. He says, Lord, I don't even know where to start with yeah. all this. And, and so that's what I was carrying. And then I, it started breaking me down in my house. I started thinking that my kids hated me. Mm-hmm. My wife hated me. Um, I started thinking my mum hated me. I thought it was dirt and filth. And, and just over was this a paranoia? Paranoia, paranoia again. In prison, were you still taking drugs or something? No, no, no. In prison, I'd taken drugs. Yeah, and that's what they put it down—the paranoia. Okay. But I, there's no drugs at this stage. No. Um, but just my mind was attacking me. Okay. Attacking me and and, and trying to. As, uh, the way I see it, it was just the mind, and if you, if you believe it was a God, you have to believe it was a devil, and I believe that's what was happening. I didn't know then; I just thought it was me. Your mind was being attacked. Yes, and and and, and it was attacked with truth. Mm-hmm. that I was rotten and I was stinking and I was filthy and people thought I was a nice fella and a good fella and, and I, I, I didn't think I was and so is this is this conviction is this a I mean is this even God's spirit working on you to, I, I, to I convict believe, you before he brings you to faith before he converts 100%, you 100% I believe 100% and you know the funny thing is the more people treated me nice the worse it was <laughs> Do you know what I mean? And people say the worse you felt. Yeah, we're supposed to show people the love of God, and if you show people the love of God, it will convict them. Um, because I, I certainly wasn't a nice person, um, and so what happened was um, I started breaking down the house again, and and thinking of taking my own life. I got up one stage during the night, and to go out the door, don't even know where I was going. I was going to get in the car and just go. And my wee brother had been sitting downstairs. I didn't know he he stopped me getting out the door, and um, thank, thankfully. And then what happened was a, a, a pastor, this day, they got a pastor come over and see me, who had married me and my wife years before. All right. um, and he talked to me and he says to me, if you take your own life, your children will never get over it. And so what the, what the, what the situation was, was me saying, I can't live with what I am in a piece of dirt and, 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 and I want to take my life. And he was saying to me, but if you take your life, your kids will never get over it. Do you know what I mean? Can you love that? My man was telling me that my rottenness was affecting the kids. Oh. Right? And so I was going... Uh, he said, "Me, if you kill heal yourself, then never, you'll never get, they'll never get over it. If, if you don't kill them, you infect them, and I didn't know what to do. And all I can tell you is, and, and this all this all was happening over a period of days. I fell on my knees in the house um, with my family all around me who aren't Christians, and I cried out to God, and I, and I cried out to God um, to say I was sorry, mm-hmm. and I cried out to God to say that I was sorry I made a mess, and I'm sorry I rejected Jesus, and I'm sorry I thought I'd lost my soul, so I didn't think I could be saved. I wasn't trying to be saved. I was trying to say that I'm sorry to God, and." Um, in prison, when I was in the sick out of word, I'd heard a word in my ear called repent. I'd never heard repent in my life before, and I asked people what it meant. And, and what happened was, I fell on my knees in my house, and I started crying out to God and saying, I'm sorry for all the things I'd done, and I'm sorry, I don't know what to do. And, and, and what, what I'd done was give it over to God. I, I came and gave it and said, I don't know what to do. And I believe that, that he took it away. He stabbed across for our sins. And in that day, I believe I repented from the sin, and the exchange was God took my guilt and shame off me. Um, mm-hmm. um, and, and I could see it in that day, born again. That's where the chains are gone. I was broke free. I was set free from my sin. Um, Your family must have been just so amazed. Well, well they, they, were, they were worried because the word was going. And, and I have a sister-in-law from Manchester who came back and we lot from a wee brother from Man United. And she said she never believed in God before. But what she seen that day, she says, and I believe it was God. 
Um, and I believe 100% that God saved me. And I asked my pastor, why did he save me in such a way? He says, well, you'd never believe. You'd never believe. And, and even today, God, I can't deny this. God knows it. I struggle with what I've done in my life. Mm-hmm. I struggle. But I, I prayed to God about it before, and, and, and he says to me, but you, you understand this, that I have forgiven you for it. And I go, what do you? I understand that. He says, well, then, my grace will be sufficient to take you through. Do you know what I mean? And so mm-hmm. that's where I live, in God's grace. Mm-hmm. And in his, in his, and I live for Jesus, mm-hmm. for Christ. And he's taken over my life. And mm-hmm. he's the one that directs my path. And he's sure. taken me. And that's who directed me here. You've been involved in here yeah. a while, uh, Bobby. And, you know, we have a sense that um, you really understand the young people. Yeah. That you understand um, a lot of their struggles and uh, problems, difficulties. You said that you lay floors, and you've been very involved in artwork here. Yeah. And some of your artwork is on the walls. Sometimes God calms the storm, sometimes he lets the storms rage and calms his child, which is what you've been talking yeah. about. And also the lovely cross that you've made, stacks of artwork for Christmas. You're chatting to young people though as you draw and yeah. paint, because you're, you're part of the prison arts yeah. Foundation, aren't you? Yeah. And but as you do these drawings and everything of all kinds with yeah. the young people, you're getting an opportunity just to chat to them. Just talk. Yeah. Well, I, I just believe that you can't hit something over the head of the Bible. I no. believe you have to spend you spend time with people, and and so what you're doing is trying to spend time with them and find out about them and and and, and just get to know them mm-hmm. and let them get to know you um, mm-hmm. and tell them that you've made mistakes and yeah. that you your life was off the rails. Um, but also to turn and tell them that, that there's, there's hope. Uh, my heart is for, for young people who, who probably haven't done half the things I've done, but I, I know the end result of where they're going, and it's not nice, um, because you can't get away from what you've done. Your mind won't let you. I've had a lot of my friends who don't life for me are dead now because they couldn't live with what they've done they took their own lives. And so I know the end result. And so what I'm trying to do is show them how I got out of it all, show them that there's a way out, and that way out is Jesus. Um, and I don't believe there's no other way. I believe in the system of education and all the different things around it. Yeah. But I believe from, for people to be totally set free and to have peace and joy in their mind and in their heart, they have to be Jesus. Yeah. And so, so many people think religious is polite, religious is part of society, yeah. religious is something you have, it's a nice frill on the edge of your life. But really what you're saying is yeah. that's just not real. No. Jesus is talking about something very core, very central. Yeah. radical change of heart yeah. and life and that happened for you yeah yeah see I, I, I just believe well I know now there's a God I know now Jesus died on the cross and so there is an enemy mm-hmm. and so in prison my, my enemy told me that my my mates hated me right? mm-hmm. in my house he told me that my family hated me mm-hmm. um, I didn't tell myself that so it came from somewhere and it started in the, in, in, in the, in the, in the start from Adam and Eve mm-hmm. um, when God said, said who told you that who told you that? Who told you that? Right? So yeah, who's, who's, telling you, fruit. who's telling you in your mind that you're rotten? Who's telling you that you're sticking? Yeah. Who's telling you there's no hope? Who's telling you there's an enemy telling you that? That's what I believe. And so, what's people, Jesus telling you now? Jesus tells me I've forgiven you for what you've done. You, yes, you made mistakes. And as I talk to some of the kids, I says, "Don't let the start ruin the finish." Do you know what I mean? Exactly. I can't justify anything at all. I the man treated me the way I thought. He was trying to take me out, but but. But I didn't know God. I thought God was this big, you shall not do this, you shall not do that, you shall not do that. I thought that's what God was. I didn't know he's full of grace and mercy. And that's what the words on the big cross say, in gentleness and peace and goodness. And, and when you ask Jesus into your life, um, and you repent for what you've done, if you turn to him, say, I don't even know what to do with this all, and he comes in, then you'll find peace and joy and happiness. It's part of God's plan. It's, it's not a thing, well, I'll get peace because I'm working peace. You don't have to. Jesus is the centre and the fruit will appear. And part of that is peace and joy and happiness. Well, Bobby, thanks for being part of the Restore uh, course. We're hoping that the young people will take these uh, DVDs with them into yeah. their lives, be able to yeah. watch them regularly, remember their friends who are back here rooting for them and want to share love and life with them. Yeah. Education, of course, and all sorts of encouragement, but not least of all, in fact, Perhaps most of all, you know, faith in Jesus who can change life so radically. We're hoping that the young people won't ever, ever forget that.
But listen, Bobby, thanks so much. No problem. Can I finish in this verse? Um, yeah. John 3 and 16 and 17. For God okay. so loved the world, he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes him shall not perish. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but through his Son the world to save. God is not trying to condemn you. You're already condemned. He's trying to save you. And okay. he wants to save every single person in this world. I don't care what you've done. God wants to save you today. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Thanks, Bobby. Amen. We're for life. Thank you. Different types of lifers now we are. Amen. Uh-huh. Amen. Okay. I want you to discuss now about uh, turnaround testimonies, those lives that were lived fully and dedicatedly for Jesus. Lives that uh, were not always easy, people ending up in prison uh, or even dying for their faith. So is that an evidence for you that maybe these people were convinced about God? Um, And is their conviction true? I mean, is there foundation for their belief? When you think about the prophecies and when you ask, does creation have a voice that God exists? By the way, there's a, there's a helpful book and it's entitled Across the Switchblade. It's also in the library or the chaplain can access it for you. So that's worth a read, you know, another life that was completely turned around.